Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. You know, I got really sad news. Um, I did a show, episode 820. It was a members-only show with uh, David from North Louisiana. And uh, he had an encounter back 41 years ago in 1981. And uh, I told David after the show, you know, I'd li really like to put this in my best of. And I found out recently that David had actually passed away uh, here very, very recently uh, in his sleep. He went peacefully. And uh, I just really liked David. You know, when I spoke to David, he reminded me of like, gosh, I wish I had a dad or a grandfather that was a sweet old man. Uh, and that's kind of how David came across. You know, he had a, a great sense of humor. I really enjoyed chatting with him. And one thing that he told me, and you're about to hear the incident, but one thing he told me after this interview, he said, you know, Wes, one day I'm going to have to stand before God, and I don't have an answer for my actions on what I did. Uh, he really was a kind soul, and uh, it's a very fascinating account. Let's take a listen in remembrance of David. All right, sir. Well, it was it happened the first week or two of October of 1981. I worked nights at a, a small local distribution center, and I got off every morning around 5 a.m. And every morning I would go fishing. And uh, the little town I lived in, there was a, a lake about 10 miles outside of town. And that's where I would go. This one particular morning, you know, just same as every morning before, weather permitting, I was fishing. I stopped and got my bait and drove out to the lake. And as you approach the lake, the lake is on the left-hand side of the road. It's just a little two-lane blacktop road that runs out through the country. And on the right-hand side of the road is a bayou, Bayou Bartholomew. And the very first area that you can get to to fish on the lake is where I always stopped. So that morning it was still wasn't daylight and I pulled over on the left hand side of the road and parked and I got in and I took my tackle box and rod and reel and I walked up the levee to the lake. And I was standing there waiting for the sun to come up so I could see the fish and I, I just had an overwhelming sense of, of dread. Something was telling me just go home. Fish aren't going to bite today. You don't even want to be here. <clears throat> Just go home. And I'm really not sure why that happened. I mean, because I never had done that before. But I was standing there, and the sun was starting to come up, and I had my back to the road, looking out across the lake, and I heard a noise behind me. It sounded as if it came from across the road directly behind me. It was, it was kind of a groan and a growl mixed together. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard before or since. I've listened to a lot of uh, podcasts in the years, and I've never exactly heard this sound before. But anyway, the, the first two things that entered my mind when I heard it was that it either had to be an alligator or a wild hog. But I also knew at the same time that it wasn't either one of those because it was the volume of it was just too great. It was too deep and too strong for it to be that. And I was, I was, I was, for whatever reason, I was scared. I mean, I don't know why it scared me as bad as it did, but it, it really scared me. And I, I, I regretted even staying at that point. I said, I wish I'd went home when I thought about it. But I had to turn around to go down the levee to get back to my truck. And I was afraid to turn around because afraid of what I would see. And Bigfoot never entered my mind. Sasquatch never entered my mind. Uh, at that time, I had seen the legend of Boggy Creek, uh, but that was, you know, that was it. I hadn't even seen the Patterson film at that point in time. I'd heard of it and I've read about it in school books and stuff. I was kind of fascinated with it, but that never entered my mind. So anyway, I turned around real slow, and there was nothing there. I, well, let me go while I can. So I, I got my, my tackle box and rod and reel, and I walked down the levee. I got to my truck, and I still kind of looking around, still hesitant, still scared. And 
still trying to figure out why I was so scared. So I get in my truck and I, and I leave. I'm, I keep going the same direction I was going. And that road eventually led to the, the boat ramp, a great big, huge graveled area. And it was, it, like I said, it was a large lake and there was a lot of fishermen there every day. And I sat there for a little bit to calm myself down, steady my nerves, to figure out, try to figure out why I was so scared and upset. Because I've never had anything like that happen to me before, and it was it didn't make sense for me to be upset. I sat there as long as I thought I needed to. And I said, well, I'm going to leave. But I didn't want to keep going that same direction because that road turned into a gravel farm road, and it would end up 20 miles on the other side of town. So that meant I had to go back the way I came. So I rolled my windows down, and I took off going that way. And I was driving kind of slow, looking and now it would be on my left-hand side. I was looking through the, uh, the wooded area and the trees and stuff as I was driving by to see if I could see what made the noise. When I got to the area where I was at originally where I heard the noise, I pulled over to the graveled area that was on the bayou side. Why? I, don't, I do not know why I stopped. To this day, I question why I even stopped. Uh, but I did. I, it was a truck I was driving was a standard, so I put it in neutral and I put the emergency brake on and left it running in case, for whatever reason, I had to leave in a hurry. It was running. And at that point in time, back then, everybody had a gun rack in their truck. And I had a shotgun with birdshot in it because it was dove season, and I had a twenty two rifle. And I knew that whatever made that noise whether it was an alligator or a hog, it was, would be extremely large, and neither one of those would do the job. I had a pistol under my seat, and so I reached under my seat and got my pistol, and it was a large caliber handgun. It was an old Western-style single action, but it was an extremely large caliber. And I stood there looking around, uh, and there was the, the woods on that side of the road were old growth oak with a lot of Spanish moss on them. So it was kind of creepy looking anyway. Now, from the edge of the road to the drop off to the by in different locations, it would be 30 foot from the edge of the road or it would be 100 foot from the road. It's just dependent on the, the curve of the road and the curve of the by. But as I was standing there looking around, on the outside edge of the graveled area of the park, uh, the grass was about maybe a foot high, and there was a heavy dew that morning, and I saw two trails leading off toward the woods from the graveled area where something on two legs had walked through the grass and disturbed the dew on it. And I was curious then. I said, well, that's got to be a person. Maybe what I heard, somebody was hurt. Uh, it, it didn't, it was, it seemed awful loud and awful deep and strong to be a person, but that's the only thing, you know, really that could make sense, but I still didn't know. So I started walking real slow, following the, the trail through the grass. I had my head down looking at it and I would look up to see where I was going, you know, just looking up and down, back and forth. And the farther I went into the woods, the, the less grass there became and the fainter the trail was to follow. The last part that I could see it, it was leading past an oak tree. And it's, 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 it's a wooded area, but it's not so thick with woods that, you know, it's, it's just a foot or two apart. They're, they're spaced out more than that. They're, you know. uh, but anyway, I see the, the trail leading past this oak tree. So I'm walking toward this oak tree, and I get to approximately six foot from this oak tree, and this thing steps out or pivots out from behind the oak tree. And I say pivot because if it was standing behind a tree with his face against a tree, I would have seen his shoulders and arms because he was wider than the tree. So he had to be standing sideways behind it waiting for my approach. When I got with about within about six foot of the tree, he pivoted out and stood there in front of me. I instantly lost my breath. It, it, I, it, 
<clears throat> it just scared me so bad I lost my breath. I took a gasp and I stood there in just disbelief and fear. He was about seven to seven and a half foot tall. Shoulders were, if they weren't four foot, they didn't miss it by an inch or two. Waist was about three foot. It narrowed down to about a three foot waist. So he was Y shaped. Extremely, extremely muscular. Very well defined muscles, but not bulging muscles like a bodybuilder, like a Mr. Universe or something like that. More of an athletic design, useful muscles, not show muscles. His legs, his thighs were very, very thick and well-developed. Calves were kind of lean and narrow. The hair on his chest and abdomen was jet black, and it was very, very coarse hair. The, the hair uh, shafts were thicker than a human's, probably two to three times or more thicker than a human's. That it wasn't so thick that you couldn't see through it because I could still see the underlying skin under the hair. But it was just, just heavy, heavy hair, and they were about an inch and a half long. The hair across the top of his shoulders and down the back of the tops of his arms from from his his shoulders down to his elbows on the back side of the arms was probably four inches long, and it was just as thick uh it made like a i guess you would say like a cape because it, it hung down to uh mid shoulder blade in the back the hair on the back of his forearms was longer. It was probably six to eight inches long and thinner. It was more wispy, willowy hair. It was thinner. He had his hands cupped backwards. So the palm of his hands were facing away from me. His hands were cupped. And I was I was in shock. I was just, just in total disbelief. And I I didn't know what to think. Uh, I, I could hear the blood <laughs> rushing in my ears. I was just terrified. It was horrifying. And, and I knew then, you know, what it was. I had read about it, you know, in school books, but you, know, it, you had books like Monsters and Myths in America and things of, like that. There was no, in my part of the country, there was no great wealth of knowledge on it, at least that I had seen. But I knew what it was then. I uh, knew that's what made the sound, and I knew what it was. I looked this thing in the eye. His face, the hair on his head was jet black. All of all the hair was jet black, and the hair on his head was swept back, and it hung down probably to about where the cape in the back did, about mid-shoulders. He had a full beard and mustache. I could not see his lips because his mustache was so long that it hung down over his mouth. So his lips were hidden. His eyes were almond shaped. They were hazel in color. He had large black pupils. And there were whites on either side of his eyes. Uh, there were whites to his eyes. Uh, I've heard people say his eyes were jet black, you know. And I could see maybe in, in the in the darkness where the people pupils would dilate and they would appear like that because his pupils were jet black. His nose was unlike any description I'd ever heard since. Because once this happened, I have I have read and looked up anything that I could find on the subject. Most people describe a gorilla type nose. His nose was very human-like and what we always called a hawk nose. I believe I sent you a, a picture last night of a, a gentleman's nose, and it was basically that shape. He, he had ears. Uh, they were covered by the hair, but I could still see them through the hair. Everything on his face was symmetrical. I mean, everything was proportionate to his size except for the ears, they seemed to be a little longer from top to bottom than 
what you would think they would have been on a person. If it was a person looking at you and their ears were like that, you would think, well, he's got some big ears. They weren't outlandishly big, but they were seemed a little bigger than what they should be. <clears throat> he had an Arab look to him. And I don't mean that as any type of uh, ethnic slur or anything of that nature. At the time, I did not know what that look was. It was only in the years afterwards that I discovered what that look was. I looked him dead in the eye, and he was looking at me, and he had a look on his face of amusement. He had an impish look in his eyes, almost like he was happy. I could see his cheeks rise up as if when someone smiles, you know, their, their cheeks rise up. You can see their eyes crinkle in the corners. That's what he did. I couldn't see his lips because of the mustache, but I tell, I could tell he was smiling. He was happy. He was pleased that this had happened. He had to be sitting there knowing that I was coming and waited on me. And I, 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 I forgive me for stammering. It, bringing, I've only spoke about this out loud to one other person, and you know who that was. Yeah, no apologies needed at all, David. I know this happened to you over 40 years ago, and I can't even imagine being in this position. And you you relive it every time you tell it. And you're doing great. I really do appreciate you. And, and by the way, the whole Arab thing, um, I, I, I think most people realize that's not racist. Uh, so, you know, sometimes people say they look like Native Americans and what they're referencing is the uh, certain features. You know, Native Americans have pretty features. They have round eyes. And uh, so I think, you know, it's okay to relate it that way. Uh, I don't even want you to worry about that. So what kind of happens next? Well, I'm standing there and I'm looking at him and I, and I notice the expression on his face and I look him up and down. That's how you know I'm getting a better description of the body and the hair and everything because I, I I slowly look at my eyes travel all the way down and all the way back up. It was a male, and all all the way back up. And when I make eye contact with him again, he still has that. It's almost like a smirk, for lack of a better term, on his face. So then he looks me up and down. He never moves his head, just his eyes. His eyes travel all the way down me and all the way back up. It's when he looks back at me, I don't think it was a look to like he was sizing me up. I'm, I'm sure he had done that when he saw me get out of the truck and walk that way. This was more of, I took it as, he was mocking me, you know, as if you looked at me, well, I'm going to look at you. So, and I was terrified. I could hear the blood just pumping in my ears. It was, it was ex just, I don't know. I was just extremely afraid, terrified. Uh, the time lapse on this is really hard to determine. From beginning to end, it could have been 10 minutes it could have been a little bit longer. Uh, I'm really not exactly sure. But I look at this thing, and he he like he looks me up and down, and and he can see the fear on me, and he seems to be getting pleasure from my fear. Like you know, he's really happy. And then he does something odd. Uh, he kind of leans his his eyes get go from this merriment and glee his face becomes relaxed because I can see his cheeks lower back down and his eyes take on a glassy look uh, kind of a glazed look like maybe he's looking in the distance or in deep fault or something and he kind of leans his head and upper chest back not, not a whole lot just a little bit and he starts to make a noise. The noise was something I will try to mimic it. It was 
if the and it kept getting stronger and louder and deeper and he was building himself up uh for whatever he was fixing to do i i like i said i was terrified he wasn't looking at me anymore his head was he was like i said looking kind of upwards his eyes were glassy looking and I knew right then that he was, you know, the the, the, the thought that come to my mind, and, and I remember thinking this, this is probably going to sound silly, but I remember thinking mama's going to be so sad because I knew I was dead. I mean, I knew he was working himself up into a bloodlust. That's the only way I could describe it. It's just he was a bloodlust. He was working himself up into doing whatever it was he was fixing to do. And I, my opinion, that was he was fixing to kill me. At this, yeah, you know, up until then, I had forgotten that I even had the pistol with me. And I guess when he looked me up and down, he didn't notice it just from the way I was standing because it was hanging down by my right side, kind of behind my leg a little bit, but maybe not all the way. But when he started making this, and my level of fear, I didn't think it'd go any higher, but it actually went higher. I remembered I had it, and I, like I, said, I knew that he was fixing to do whatever it was he was fixing to do, and that my time was just about up, and I figured, well, I'm not going to go out without doing something. I'm going to shoot him anyway. So the pistol I had, like I said, it was a heavy caliber, large bore pistol, and it was a single action, which meant you had to pull the hammer back to fire it. So I started raising my arm up. Not real fast, but not just real slow, just kind of a deliberate de deliberate movement. And as I'm raising my arm, I'm rolling the, the hammer back, and it made three distinct clicks as it locked the cylinder into place. He heard that sound. And within just a matter of seconds, he snapped out of the bloodlust. He looked at me and he looked at the, the gun in my hand. And his eyes turned to rage, hatred, rage, uh, anger. Uh, the time that it took for me to raise my arm pull the hammer, him hear it, his facial expression and eyes changed was about two and a half seconds, maybe. I've, I've, I've done this motion before. I've timed it just to see it from best of my memory. So in about two and a half seconds, all of that happened. My arm raised. I pulled the hammer back. He heard it. He looked at me. He looked at the gun. <clears throat> And when the gun was about just a little more than eye level, I fired. The bullet struck him mid, uh, just to the, on him, it would be just to the left of his breastbone. Just to the left of his breastbone, maybe three quarters of the way up his chest. The impact of the shot, because what, what, by the time my arm was extended, I, my arm was three foot from his chest, probably three foot. The impact of the, the round staggered him back two feet. He took two steps backwards and sat down on his butt hard. He looked at me, and the, the look on his face then was, of shock and almost like betrayal, like how could you do this? Like I, I you know, it was it, the, the 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 range of emotions in his face were so human-like. The expressions were so human-like. And then it, the his eyes changed from the shock or betrayal look to pain. I knew then he was feeling pain. And 
he started bleeding. He took his left hand and he and he and he and he clutched his chest. He looked at he looked at his hand and it was it was bleeding heavily. He looked back up at me, and it was just fear. Then he had fear. I don't think he'd ever felt pain like that before. I don't think. Of course, if he had, he'd. Be, I mean, it, it was it, it it was it was it was really very emotional. <clears throat> he opened his mouth to make a noise, and he gurgled. Uh, and then blood started coming from his mouth. And if, if you ever have deer hunted and what they call a lung shot, you, you'll see they'll get a pink, frothy blood come from their mouth. Well, that's what started coming out of his mouth. So I knew then that I had shot him in the lungs. He was still making a gurgling noise like he was trying to, make another noise, but it just, he just couldn't. I think he was in so tense from the, from the impact and the blood that, that was coming up that all I could do was gurgle. And he was bleeding heavily from the wound and the mouth, more so the mouth. Uh, it was dripping down his chest onto his abdomen. And I knew then, with the amount of blood that was coming, that uh, it was fatal. That, 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 that I, like I said, I had hunted all my life. And I had accidentally flung shot a deer before, and I know there there was no recovery from what had just happened to him. He was not going to recover. He was still sitting on his on his behind with his left hand clutching. The, the entry wound and he rolled to his left and took his right hand and put it on the ground and used it to steady himself to stand up when he stood up his back was to me and there was no exit wound so I knew then that that caliber of that bullet that went in there it just damaged everything that was inside because it didn't exit it was a 265 grain bullet and it didn't exit. So it went in, it did its damage and he was, he was dying. There was no recovery for what happened. He, uh, he started walking toward the edge of the bluff toward the bottom. And this one particular tree had a, a vine hanging from it, probably about an inch diameter vine. And he got to the tree, and he took his right hand and steadied himself against the tree. Was, excuse me. He took his right shoulder and leaned and steadied himself against the tree. His left hand was still clutching his chest. He grabbed the vine with his right hand, and he stepped over and eased down over the side of the bluff. From, from that, in that area, it was about 30 foot to the water. So I stood there, and I never heard a splash. So if he had died and fell into the water, I would have heard a splash. So he either crawled down the bank, the, the, the cliff to the bank, and got into the water or into the woods, or he was still there. And I, I didn't want to go to the cliff to look over because I was afraid he was still there and that he would grab me. Uh, once he disappeared from, you know, when he went over the side and disappeared, I can't really tell you how long I stood there. It was probably 10 or 15 minutes anyway, if, if not longer. I stood there trying to gather my thoughts as best I could. And the thing that, that hit me, uh, when I well, I started walking back to the truck, and I got back to my truck, and I got in. The truck was still running. I thought to myself, "I just killed a person. I just killed a man." The reason I said that is because the facial features were so human-like: the shape of the eyes, the shape of the nose, 
There was no hair on the cheeks, but a, but a, a full beard and mustache. And the expression that it, the range of emotion that it displayed in his eyes, uh, from, from enjoyment and uh, kind of an impish glee that it had trapped me to a mocking look when he looked me up and down to his, what I call his bloodlust to anger to dismay and pain and then shock and betrayal. I mean, every every one of those emotions he expressed with his eyes. The only sounds I ever heard from this thing was what was made the at the time I was fishing, the, the groan or growl. And then when he started working himself up into a frenzy, and, I, and I've heard similar noises at the zoo. You know, from uh, apes or whatever. It was just, I've heard them make that noise before. But I thought I just shot a man. I went, I, I was, I was numb. I was very, very numb and in shock. Uh, still terrified. So I left there and I drove home. I, at the time I was 18, like I said, I still live with my parents. So I went home and all the rest of that day and all the next day, I uh, spoke very little. My parents, you know, would ask me, son, you all right? What's wrong? It's all girl problems. You know, just I would try to dismiss it, change the subject. Two days after it happened, I wanted to drive back out there to see uh, if anything was going on. And I, like I said, it was about 10 miles out of town. The first few miles were residential houses. This next couple miles, you know, there was a farm here and a farm there. And about the last four or five miles, it was just fields or, or wooded areas. There was no houses or anything. And right before you got out the, to that point, there was just a, there was a, 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 a sign in the road. It said road closure bridge out. We had to turn, you know, they were turning traffic around. There were no people there, just a sign. But there was a little area right there to turn around. So I turned around. Then I was really scared. I said, well, somebody has found something. So for the next several, several, several days, I kept waiting for a knock on the door. I kept waiting for the police. Because if someone found this thing and they did an autopsy, they would find the bullet. and. I was the only person in that area who had that caliber of handgun because I would have to get the shell special ordered for me. So that would have been an easy way to track, you know, who it was. So I I was in fear that any day that someone was going to knock on the door because I really thought that I killed a person. So as time goes on, as years roll by, I have looked into all kinds of different things to try to make sense of my encounter. At that point in time, there was no internet. Uh, I went to the public libraries, uh, but there was still not that much knowledge on them. There were no actual photographs that I could find. Uh, Just some sketch drawings, and the sketch drawings in the books didn't look anything like what I had saw. So I'm still swaying toward a human. Then I started, after I got that in my head, I started looking up through encyclopedias and stuff, different facial structures and characteristics of different ethnic groups. I would look, you know, for different locations, regions of the world. And one day I come across a picture of an Arab man. And I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty close just from the shape of the nose and the shape of the eyes. And then I started looking again, the more in that area and say Syria, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, all in that region right there, they share a lot of the same facial characteristics, a lot of the same facial features, not all of them, but there's a strong trait in all in that area. And that's what I thought. 
that's where I got the Arab look from. I said, well, that's, that's what it looked like. It looked Arabic. <laughs> I know I told myself it's not, but that's, that's the best way that I could describe it. Years later, the internet came along and that opened up a vast knowledge. By that time, I had seen the film. And yeah, you broke up there, David. Was it the Patterson film? Is that what you said? Yes, sir. And it, that wasn't exactly what I saw. That, that, you know, she was huge and square and bulky. Whereas this, this one was, he, he was about seven, seven and a half foot tall. Probably if I had to guess a weight, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 pounds. Wasn't barrel chested. It was long, useful muscles, not, not show muscles. I mean, very, very, very muscular. Don't get me wrong, but it was not like bodybuilders, just blowed up muscles. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I know you're nervous, and this has haunted you really for the last 40 years, and I get all of that. And to be honest with you, David, if I was in your shoes, I would have shot too, uh, especially being at point-blank range. And if I have a feeling it's getting squirrely on me, I'm absolutely going to shoot it. Um, You know, a lot of eyewitnesses, they'll say what I ran into was King Kong. You know, take Arnold Schwarzenegger and make him a 1,000 pounds, and that's basically what I saw There is eyewitnesses, though, that will say uh, it was big, bigger than me, but it reminded me more of like a basketball type body type. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. If as what I I call uh, useful muscles, I mean, they're they're athletic muscles. Uh, They're not just pumping iron to build up mass. It was very much like a like a, a basketball player or a track star. Uh, something like that. I mean, they were the the thigh muscles were very very developed. The abdomen was lean and hard. It was narrow waisted, broad chested, but it wasn't a barrel chest. I mean, the bone structure made the shoulders wide. The chest muscles, the pecs, were very defined. The arm muscles, the biceps and triceps, were very defined, but they weren't overly defined. I mean, it, it was just a very fit and very toned for its size. Very fit and very toned. But yes, I, I agree. It was, you know, like a basketball player or something like that. I mean, it was, yeah, and, and looking at all these things, you know, uh, I, I, I started listening to podcasts. I discovered those and I started listening and I've listened to a bunch of them. And for the most part, uh, I would say 80%, if not more. And no offense to anybody listening or whatever. I, I certainly hope, you know, but most of them were just, I don't know. They weren't very informative. They weren't very sincere. I've have listened to a few that are. And I say this, <clears throat> yours is by far the very best that I've, I've, I've listened, I think, to every episode. I wasn't a member for a long time. I would listen to it on YouTube, and then I realized that I was missing a lot of episodes that were, you know, member episodes. So I I joined so I could hear those. I was trying to get any encounter that I could to sway my mind that I didn't kill a person. And there's a member on there that I became friends with on Facebook. We belong to a couple different Bigfoot clubs. I guess you'd call them clubs. And we have spoke numerous times, you know, in emails and text messages. We had talked about her encounter many times, and she's a very sincere lady. I've uh, got a lot of respect for her. And it came up one night. She asked me if, if, if I had ever had an encounter, and I told her yes, but I wasn't ready to talk about it. And she said, well, you know, if you ever get ready to talk about it, I'm here to listen. So I guess it's it's probably been a, a, a while since that conversation and we were speaking again, we don't, you know, one night and, and I told her as well, I, I think I'm ready to tell you my encounter. And I had never spoke this out loud in 41 years, almost none of my family believes in Bigfoot. I'm married. My wife doesn't believe in it. They think it's all a bunch of hooey and, and just a big joke. 
So I would never dare mention it to them. So I've kept this inside for like 40 plus years, thinking that I, I've tried to convince myself that it wasn't a person that I should, and that it had to be a Sasquatch and, and that, and that, the, and that they're not human. Even with, uh, uh, some of the Melba catching test results, you know, showing that the mitochondrial DNA was, you know, uh, human. I still try to convince myself that it wasn't. Yeah, and I understand where you're coming from, David, and I'm I'm curious how you felt today. But, you know, looking back, I could see why you would think it was a human. A lot of eyewitnesses say they were very human-like. Take the hair away and make them a little bit smaller, and they would pass as human. Not every in- encounter. You know, there's other encounters where people go, it reminded me more of a chimp. But there are the ones, as you and I talked about off the air, uh, many hunters who've had them in the scope and didn't fire because the facial expressions and just everything screamed some weird human. um, So they couldn't pull the trigger. Again, I don't know if it brings you comfort or not. I don't buy for two seconds that these creatures are human. uh, But that's my opinion. Um, What are your thoughts today? I mean, what are your feelings on... You know, I can't imagine walking around for 40 years and this weight on your shoulders. How do you feel about what happened 40 years later? Well, I'll put it this way. I mean, I've, I've, I've pondered this, like I said, a long time. If uh, if we had not been so close, within six foot of each other, if I if he had been across the road or if he had been across the field, I would not have shot. Because I thought somewhere in there was a person. I would not have shot. The only reason I shot is because I thought I was fixing to die. He was working himself up and to do something, and I thought he was fixing to do it. And I figured, well, if I'm going out, I'm going out with a bang. And I raised my gun up and fired. Uh, I didn't think, to be honest with you, I didn't know if it would do any good or not, but that's the only thing I had in my hands, so that's what I did. At that time, let me. At that time, I probably wouldn't have shot if it had been further away. Looking back at it now, when I told my story to this lady, this other member, she was silent. I, I, I went through the whole thing, and I was way. I was all over the place telling the story because I would back up and said, "Well, I forgot this," and I. I'd go forward a little bit more and say, wait, wait a minute, hold on, let me back up a little bit. When Anyway, when I got through with the story, I asked her, I said, I want to ask you one question before you say anything. I said, do you think I shot a, a human, a person? She said, no. And just for hearing one person tell me that was such a weight lifted off my mind and off my heart that it was, it was such, a, it was just like a deep, breath that I felt immediately better Uh, because I've tried to convince myself it wasn't a human, Uh, you know, and and I know in my heart and in my head, it wasn't a human. It's just that some of the characteristics were so human like, uh, especially the eyes. I mean, because that's what, that's what threw me off all these years was just the eyes, just the, the expression in, in those eyes, the way they changed, and my under being and being able to understand what the the expressions were, but I know I know now that it wasn't her telling me that is what made me come forward to you because I told her she said, "Oh, you've got to you know you've got to let Wes know this, you've got to let him know this story," and I really didn't want to. I said, well, I'm not looking for notoriety. I'm not looking for anything like that. I said, I've lived with it this long. I can live with it a little bit longer. I said, you gave me all the validation that I was really looking for. Just saying it out loud, talking the whole story out loud, and having one person tell me, no, it wasn't a human. That was such a relief. But you have done so much i've listened to like i said almost every one of your podcasts if i've missed one of them i don't know which one it was because i've listened to a bunch of you and i were discussing that on our previous conversations about the earlier ones and the ones now but you 
your 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 demeanor, your mannerism, your way that you talk to the people is very comforting. Is you, you're not judgmental. You don't. You're not forming opinion. You're not trying to make someone change their story to fit a narrative. You're you're, you're very open. You're very accessible, and I respect you very much for that. And you you were the only person that I'll ever go on the air to tell this to. Like I said, I told her to get my validation. I'll tell it to you in case, for whatever reason, somebody, there may be somebody out there that's had an encounter just like this one, and it was just like me that has never come forward with it because they thought that. Well, I'm here to tell them they can get that off their mind and get that off their heart because it wasn't a, a human. And if they want to come forward with it, then it is a great burden removed. Just, just talking it out loud. Uh, but you were the only one that I would tell it to, uh, because the way you handle your, yourself and your guests and your show, I commend you for the, for the, uh, the work that you do. I know that it's time consuming, that it's all consuming because, you know, just the time you spent talking with me and I'm just one person and I'm, there's multiple. So, and then when you get all that, you've got to put it together and edit it and, and get it ready to, to be broadcast. So I know that what you do is very, very time consuming and you're very dedicated to it. And you have helped a lot of people, whether you, uh, you're humble and you won't admit it, but you have helped a lot of people sleep easier at night. Just being able to say it out loud, what happened. Yeah, I'm humbled by your kind words, David. You didn't have to say any of that. Thank you for saying it. And, you know, the, there is a lot of people out there who have shot these things and probably have been walking around for years with kind of this weight on their shoulders. And if anyone's listening to your account and they get a relief or that burden kind of gets lifted, um, that's really, I, I'm well rewarded. That's the most thanks I need. Listening to your account and really what happened to you in this moment in time, I don't, I, as I told you before, I would have shot it too. If I would have thought for one second, this thing's going to get squirrely, I'm shooting it. I wouldn't have hesitated. And you talk about that behavior of them uh, kind of working themselves up. And, and you hear that time and time again. Uh, from eyewitnesses, and it's usually right before they attack or come after you. Um, looking back now, having over 40 years to really think about this moment, do you think now looking back, its next move was to harm you? Most definitely. Just from his actions, like his eyes had glazed. Oh, oh, there was one important part that I left out, and I'm very sorry. Uh, I did this talking with the other person the other night. When he started making this noise, he he had turned his head and chest kind of leaned backwards, and he was making this oh, 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 noise. As he was doing that, I heard something, and I felt something on my legs. And I looked down, and he was about, and I'm not trying to be tacky, but he was probably half aroused and was urinating on me. and it was. That's what I was hearing is it, I felt it hitting my legs and I could hear it hitting the ground. He was, he was urinating. And that's when I said, told myself, you know, I said, my God, he's, he's working himself up into a bloodlust. And those were the words I thought of at that time was blood, bloodlust. And that's, that's the only way to describe it. He was working himself into a frenzy and I knew that I was fixing to die. I knew I was fixing to die, and it was at that moment that I remembered that I had the gun. And like I said, in just the two and a half seconds that it takes to raise your arm up and pull the hammer back, his his facial features changed from glassy-eyed to, to anger. Now, I don't know if he actually knew that that was a gun. I could have held a rock in my hand and him be just as angry. Uh, I think I don't, you know, I, I know that he knew that it was a, uh, a weapon of some sort, but, you know, a rock or a stick can be a weapon. I don't know if he actually knew that, hey, that's a gun and he's fixing to shoot me. I, 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 I don't know that. 
Uh, he just knew that I had something, and he was extremely angry. I mean, just raging anger in his eyes. And that's when I pulled the trigger. And I also understand what you're saying, David. You know, when we were talking about earlier how uh, sometimes when hunters have these things in their scope and they're looking at it through the scope, they think it's, you know, some weird human. Um, and But in your situation, you're not looking downrange through a scope, you know, trying to focus in on what it is. You're right there, right in front of this thing. How close do you think you two were when you fired? We were standing about six foot apart, and but with my arm extended, the the gun was probably three foot from his chest. Yeah, so I mean, you're basically at point blank range when you fired, and you got such a great look at this creature, and you did a really good job at describing what you saw. Um, and my question is, what do you think that they are? And I ask everyone that, David, and there's no wrong answer. Um, just with your experience being a very unique and up close experience, what do you think that these creatures are? <laughs> you know, I I knew you were going to ask that. It's, I knew you were, and I thought about that all day long. Uh, there is no easy answer for that. I will say this: I believe I don't believe that it is human like we are, like you and I, and modern people i think that it is a mixture somewhere deep down in there there are some humanoid qualities just just and just from the range of emotions in its face i know i know apes and chimpanzees they have emotions and even dogs you know that's where the expression puppy dog eyes come from they can look sad and it's, so it, it's hard to say that that is all human expression because animals make it too. I think I think it's God. I think it's part ape or or some type of primate. I'm not going to say ape. I mean uh, some some type of primate because of the just the the noises that it makes. I've heard that in zoos before. I've heard. In the primate house, them making that noise, the hair, the hair was thick, way thicker than uh, human hair. And I'm talking about the hair shafts themselves. I think there's, I think it's a mixture. I think it's somewhere along the evolutionary line uh, where humans branched off. This was a sub branch, and I don't know if it just developed anymore or. If it, it maybe it didn't need to develop anymore, it developed all it needed to because it could survive in the wild. It didn't. It didn't need to adapt, you know. Whereas you know we adapt our 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 you know, human bodies adapt over the over time to our climate and the situations that we live in. They didn't need to. They had everything they needed. They had the hair that they could, you know, would thin out or get thick, I guess, for comfort and warmth, hunting skills. They were the, the apex predator. There's nothing I know of that would, that could take on this, even the one I saw. And, you know, I want to, uh, something else. If you look at looking at this thing, this may not make any sense at all. But if I, it was, if it was a person standing there, because this other, person this lady asked me the other day if i thought that it was a juvenile and i thought it was kind of an odd question because of the size and i said no i figured it was in his early 30s and she she laughed she said well what do you mean by that i said well just the fact of the smoothness of the skin it wasn't all wrinkly and it didn't look old it didn't look like a a, a juvenile if it was if i had to put it in people years if it was a man standing there that size, I would say that he was in his early 30s. Well, fit athlete in his early 30s. That was the impression I got. He wasn't very young, but he wasn't old either. But I, I think they they bleed, they breathe, they eat, they and they die. I think uh I don't think they're I don't think they're, you know, extraterrestrial. I don't think they're uh I don't know. I mean I, I 
they have a lot of the same qualities we do. They need to eat. They need to sleep. They need shelter. I don't think they need as much as we do because they, they've adapted and, and situated themselves to their environment. But I believe somewhere along the human, human evolutionary chain, they just branched off and stopped developing because they didn't need to anymore. I may be totally wrong, uh, but I think it's somewhere ape and human. I mean, some type of primate human mixture. I, Wes, I, I really don't know. <laughs> it's, 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 it's hard to even put. As long as I stood there and looked at this thing, I still don't know what it is. I know it's not a, I know it's not a man. I, now I know that it's not a man. Yeah, I hear you. And I think it's a fair answer. I mean, especially with the encounter that you had. And it's one of those things to where I can't imagine walking around for and holding on to this uh, for 40 years. Uh, you know, after this whole thing happened, did you ever go back to that, the place where this happened? Well, like I said, two days afterwards, I tried to go out there and the road was closed. So the next day I went back and the road was open and I drove through there. I couldn't see any activity where, you know, people had been in there to just, you know, quote unquote, discover the body. Uh, but it was, that was my most favorite fishing spot that I had. And I didn't go back there for about a year or so. Uh, and then not early morning, I waited till it was well daylight and I went armed. But, uh, you know, it, it was after, it was well after a year before I it went back to the woods. Yeah, I hear you. Were you ever able to find peace in what happened that day? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know this is uh, it's kind of silly to say it, but when I spoke to the, the other member the other night, the very first time that I spoke the whole story out loud, and I asked her, "Do you think I shot a person?" Without hesitation, and most definitely, she said, "No, you did not shoot a person." At that at that point. I felt peace. I, I just needed somebody to tell me because I had nobody to tell this to. I didn't. I didn't know who to reach out to. That's the reason I, I said I was listening to broadcast podcasts to see if there was someone I could go to, but none of them seemed sincere until I get run across yours. And then I had to listen. I, I was intrigued to listen. Then at that point to see if anybody else's story matched mine. <clears throat> there was a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences. But when I, I told her my story, and she said, no, it was not human. At that point, yes, a, a huge weight was lifted off my mind and off my heart because I, I didn't know what to believe. I mean, I knew deep down that it was some type of creature, but it wasn't a human. But I still couldn't talk myself out of it. I just needed a little bit of validation for somebody telling me, no, it wasn't. And when she did that, she said, well, you know, now you've got to talk to Wes. And I said, well, I don't need to now. I've got what I needed. I've got the peace I needed. And she said, well, but there may be somebody else out there that needs that peace that won't come forward because they think their encounter was unusual and that they killed a person. Here you tell your story. Maybe they'll come forward to tell theirs, and they can get some peace. And that made a lot of sense to me. It was a whole lot of sense. And that's when I told her, I said, well, I'll talk to him. And she contacted you. Gone but not forgotten. Rest in peace, my friend. Until next time, everyone.